getting settled back in, turn in your Bibles, if you have it with you, to Deuteronomy chapter 6, okay? If you have your Bible with you while everybody's getting settled back down, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Go back to that first one, Gary, if you don't care. Look up here, man. Look at that screen. Whether you are a young man who is a husband and father-to-be, whether you are a young married man preparing to have children, whether you are a young married man who already has a child, oh Lord, Maybe you're a middle-aged man with children. Or maybe you've been blessed to see your children grow up and bear children. And so that makes you a grandfather. Maybe you are a great-grandfather. And I know there are several of those in here. You need to hear a message this morning. Men, you can do it. You can do it. The world around you telling you you can't, you stink, you're stupid. I'm telling you, based on the Word of God, you can do it. You're not stupid. You don't stink. You're not the bad guy. You're not a bad dad. You're not a bad grandfather. You are an imperfect human being saved by the grace of God. And you can do it. I hope that you, like me, are sick and tired of the way that a father is presented on TV and in social media. He's always the bumbling dummy. He's he's always the the Simpson-esque father. And I'm here to tell you, no, you are not. You are a Christ-like father and grandfather. You don't have to be conformed to the image of this world because you have been given an opportunity to be conformed to the image of Christ. So dads, granddads, dads-to-be, you can do it. Is it easy? No. Is it possible? Yes. Will there be sacrifices? Absolutely. Must there be changes? You bet. Can you do it? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. What will have to occur? Well, you will have to yield so that a better father can take your place. But he doesn't come from without, he comes from within. A better father to live in and through you for the glory of God and for the benefit of your family and children and grandchildren. But you can do it. You'll have to say no often to yourself so that you can say yes frequently to the leadership of God in your life. But men, I am here to tell you this is not an opinion. This is not a thought. This is what God's Word speaks. You can do it. You can do it. And anyone that tells you any differently is a liar. And they're speaking falsehoods. They're being used as instruments of the enemy. You have a perfect father who is for you so that you can be a better father. You're not going to be a perfect father. There's only one of those. (laughs) There'll only ever be one of those. But you have a perfect father who is for you so that you can be a better father. And I'll take that. I told my kids this morning, they had, had a little gift, you know, kids are, kids are pretty thoughtful. Some kids are, are very thoughtful. And they get that from their mom, I'll admit that. I'm not a very thoughtful person. And so I get up, I'm drinking coffee this morning, and they get in there and they want me to come open up their gift. And I'm thinking, Lord, just the fact that they even have some means a lot to me. I don't care what it is, right? And I, I open it up, and it is a thoughtful gift. I've been packing my lunch. Bring it, uh, Betty and, and Pastor Chris. I've been packing my lunch for a couple of months, trying to eat healthy. It tastes great. Lord knows my heart. And uh, they, I, all we have at the house are these girly girl looking lunch boxes, polka dots and stripes and this zebra stuff you girls like. And I've just been toting it in because you know I'm a man. I'm I'm secure and I'm not worried about it. But evidently it bothered the kids. So they bought me a a rugged, manly, black and silver 
uh, lunch box that, that was, was real thoughtful and insulated and all that kind of stuff. Right? And, and I'm so thankful that, that kids are, are thoughtful and, and mindful and they want to show appreciation to their dad. But I want to tell you something, men. I'm not being a godly dad for the gifts. I'm not being a godly dad for the handmade cards. I'm not being a godly dad for the pats on the back. I'm being a godly dad because I have been saved and commanded to be a godly father. God saved me to be a godly man. He's commanded me to be a godly man. And He has made me without excuse. I owe it to Him as the one who has given everything to me to live in such a manner that my children see God and the Son of God through their Father. Men, you are, are not to live for the compliments of your children. You're not to live so that they might tell you how good a father you are. If they do, that is side dressing. You are to do it because you have been saved so you can and commanded so you could. It is your responsibility to continue to live a life that honors God before your wives and before your children and you have been made without excuse. You will not stand before God and come up with a good reason as to why you did not pursue godliness in your home. There's no excuses. And you'll leave here without them as well because we're going to bust a few maybe of the misconceptions that you might have. And we say this and we preach this and God's word directs this because God knows that you can do it. He knows you can do it. Young men, God is preparing you to be godly men. And if you are blessed, godly fathers. And if you are super blessed, godly grandfathers. Godly mentors. Godly coaches. Godly teachers. Godly co-workers. Men, that is your calling. Every father needs to be reminded that God can use them to make a difference. This is your reminder, men. God can use you to make a difference. I know sometimes you may not feel like you're making much of a difference. I know that the enemy would especially like for you to dwell on the things that you've done wrong. The enemy would like for you to reminisce over all the bad times. But I'm telling you that God wants to remind you that the bad times are passing away and there's some good times going to take its place. What you have done, you cannot undo. But you can certainly do better from this day forward. Certainly you can. You need to be reminded of that and encouraged of that. God's for you. He's not trying to trick you. He's not trying to trap you. He's not trying to one-up you. He wants to use you. He wants to work through you. He wants to love your children and grandchildren and use you as a vessel through which to do it. You can do it, Dad. We're going to read a passage of Scripture out of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. This is a powerful set of verses over the years that I have been here. We've, we've referenced these verses when preaching out of another text. But today, we're going to just walk through these verses. I will speak Honestly, that, that these words aren't just for men. That these words are for all of us. But they are especially for men. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 starting at verse 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This passage of Scripture is an all-encompassing one. Everything that is mentioned in the verses that we've just read encompass all of your life. Whether you're here or there, whether you're coming or going, this is the command for you. 
There's no time in your life when this command, these words, this scripture, this truth does not apply. When you are at work, it applies. When you are at home, it applies. When you're at church, it applies. When you are all alone and nobody's watching, it still applies. When your children are young, it applies. And when they're old, it applies. And when you have grandchildren and great-grandchildren, God's Word still applies to your life. Let's walk through these one at a time. The first thing that we're told in verse 4 is this. Listen. Men, you will gain nothing from this message if you do not listen. You will, you, this will be a waste of your time if you do not have an ear willing to hear. What does that mean? I am ready to surrender to the Word of God. I will yield to what the Word says. Even if it requires that something within me or about me must change. I will yield to the Word of God. Listen. Of course, Moses here is speaking to Israel. This is shortly before Moses will die. And they will enter into the promised land. Moses is going to lead them through wilderness. But he's not going to cross the river and into the land flowing with milk and honey. And so God is using him and his words to prepare these people for the joy of the Lord that they're going to enter into. Later on in this passage of Scripture, God is saying, I'm telling you these things to prepare you for what? You're going to enter into a land and live in homes you didn't build. You're going to have barns that you did not raise. You're going to have gardens that you did not plant. You're going to reap the labor of others. And if you're going to do it well, and if you're going to continue to give the one who alone should get the glory, then you're going to have to do this in advance. You're going to have to do these things that you and I just read to prepare you for the promised land, to prepare you for the reward. Well, it's the same for us men. Not a physical promised land, but a spiritual one. God wants you to listen to these words so that He can prepare you in your life to reap a reward that you will see in heaven. The Bible says that you and I are to lay up our treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust can destroy them. You and I are living lives of preparation. I hope you don't seek to gain your reward while you're here because it'll be short-lived. You'll die and somebody else will get it. I hope that you're living so that you might receive your world, your reward in an eternal home where you'll get to keep it and enjoy it. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're listening to the Word of God so that God can change us and prepare us and use us. It says the Lord our, is our God, the Lord alone. Dads, you get to set the standard at home. You get to set the standard in your home. And you may not set it in my home. I'll set it there. But in your home, you're the man. You're the king of your castle. It is your responsibility to set the standard. And the very first standard that you set in your home is that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You see, you're going to look at your kids at times and you're going to look at your wife and you're going to say, God might have competition elsewhere, but not here. He will rule and reign in this place. This is His home. We will not compete with Him. We will not let the world creep into our living room to compete with Him. We will not let our lives be changed in such a way that the world is conforming us rather than Him. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord alone. Joshua said it this way, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Men, it is your biblical responsibility to set the standard in your home. You are commanded by God's grace to have the privilege of setting the standard in your home. No competition. There's one king, and it's Jesus. That should be the standard of every Christian home set by every Christian man. Verse 5 tells us this. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all of your strength. That word all there is comprehensive, isn't it? When someone says, I want all of that, they're saying if it's, 
even in many parts and pieces. I want all of those parts and pieces. Right? I, uh, I've got some parts and pieces. You'd be amazed what a quarter can accomplish at a home full of young kids. Gold right here, I'm telling you. So one quarter is called a quarter because it's not a whole. It takes four quarters to make a whole. Correct? Now, here's the way that you and I like to play our relationship with the Lord. Here's the way that we like for this transaction to occur. Okay, God, I, I am going to give you some time on Sunday morning. I'm going to come to church, and I'm even going to go to a church that doesn't get out at 12 o'clock. I'm going to give you the whole quarter. I'm going to give you the whole quarter. And so there it is. Oh, look, we've got to offer it. All right. So here it is, God. I'm going to give you some of my time on Sunday morning. God said, that's good. Where's the rest? Okay. All right, God. I'm going to give you some time on my radio. I'm going to listen to some Christian music. I'm going I'm to listen. If, I mean, if you're, if you're just getting started in your faith, you'll listen to, to real loud praise music, right? But, but, but really, when God matures you, you'll just listen to Southern Gospel. Y'all know I'm joking. I listen to all of it. I know somebody would appreciate that, though. Those of you real mature in your faith. All right, God, I'm, I'm going to give you, because I know this is how this works, because I've been through this, all right? Uh, I, I know I'm speaking truth, all right? You, I'm going to give, God, you can have some of my radio time. Some of my spare time, I'm going to listen to good music, good Christian music. And God says, okay, where's the rest? He said, well, Lord, I'm already giving you time on Sunday and, uh, and, and radio time. God, what do you want? Oh, God, I'm going, I'm going to give. That's it, God. That's what I was missing. I'm going to give something to somebody. Whether I give it to church, whether I give it to the needy, whether I give it to another ministry or organization, I'm going to give. I don't feel real good about it because I'm, I'm giving it. That means it's not mine. Somebody else is going to benefit from it. I'm, I'm going to give. And God says, that's great. Where's the rest? And you see what we want to do is we, we want to hold on to something. We want to retain something. What do you mean, God? What do you mean where's the rest? And he speaks over and over again. Don't you know that I bought all of you? Don't you know when you accepted salvation, I got all of you? Don't, don't you know that all of your sins are forgiven? Don't you know that all of eternity is going to be you and me? Don't you know that, that I've given you peace that surpasses all understanding? What, why are you trying to hold on to something? I want all of you. The Bible says all of the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And so finally, what I had thought was maybe this small piece I was going to hold on to is actually the most important. When I give him the rest of me, that's when he can really go to work. That's when he can begin not to use others to minister to me, but to use me to minister to others. When I give him all of me, then he can really use. And so I'm supposed to put that in there too. Do you see what the Bible says? You must love the Lord your God with all. Your heart is your motor. If it's not beaten, you're not going anywhere. You got you got to give him the motor. You got to give him that integral piece that keeps everything going. This thing's not working without. So he wants me to offer that to him. Lord, my motor, my heart, it's yours. But then it says I'm supposed to give him my soul. Well, that's my mind and my will and my emotions. He wants my mind. He wants my will, my direction, my goals, my aim, where I'm going. And He wants my emotions, my feelings that flutter and go back and forth so very quickly. He wants those. Why? So that He can stabilize them. He wants all of me, men, and He wants all of you. 
And then the next verse tells us this. And you must commit yourselves. Let's stop right there. And you must commit yourselves. Do you see who the command is to first? It's to you. It's to you first. The expectation is first placed on you. Before you start trying to change somebody else, before you start trying to make your kid a better kid, before you start trying to help your coworker get out of his trouble, you are going to have to commit to him. You first, Dad. Stop waiting on somebody else to go. Stop waiting on your wife to go first. You lead the way. You commit yourself, men. No excuses. Commit yourselves to what? Wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. This was given at a time of the law. Moses is going to give hundreds of commands from the Lord to God's people. But you and I do not live under the covenant of the law. The Bible says we live under a new and better covenant. The covenant of the cross. The covenant of Christ. The covenant of the blood. And so though you and I are certainly to heed all of the Lord's commands. The Bible says you and I are specifically to commit to these three things. First, men, you are to wholeheartedly commit to Christ. Christ first. Before your wife, Christ. Before your children, Christ. Before your job, before your hobbies, before your interests, before your finances, Christ. Why? Because nobody else took your place. Only Jesus. The Bible says that He must have preeminence. That's first place in all things. Commit to Christ. Secondly, you've got to commit to the cross. What does that mean? I am committed to a life of denying myself. I am committed to a life of sacrifice. Men, if you are going to do this right, you will make sacrifices. So many people, they want to be a part of it when it's good. But when it gets tough, they fail. It just gets to be a way of life. I'm going to commit to something. I'm going to be a part. That was good. And then when it gets the least bit uncomfortable, when it asks something of me, when it requires transformation, I'm sorry, I'm out. I liked it until then. But now you've gotten into my personal space and I'm not so interested. What if that's exactly what God wants to do? What if your personal space, your personal beliefs, is exactly what He wants to invade what if He has a way that is better and higher than your way? And what if He simply wants you to come to an understanding that His will and His word is better than yours? You have to commit to that. If you don't, you'll quit. You'll give up. You've got to wholeheartedly commit to the cross. And then finally, you've got to commit to the kingdom. And I'm not talking about your kingdom. And I'm not talking about our kingdom. I'm talking about His kingdom. The kingdom that He will usher in. The kingdom that He will rule and reign over. The kingdom that you, as a Christian, will be a part of. But it won't be your kingdom. It's His. And He's the King. You've got to commit to that. What does that mean? I have to live in such a way that people know it's not me and it's not mine. It's Him and it's His. I have, my words have to be spoken in such a way that people know that my life is not fixated on my life but on the life of Jesus. And that my goals are not goals that can be accomplished only here on earth but they will be fully manifested in the kingdom. That I am willing to set aside preferences so that in its place I can have the priorities of the king. I have to commit to that. Why? Because every day that means you're going to have to look in that mirror and say, no. No, not today, David. 
It's not about you today. It wasn't about you yesterday. It's not going to be about you tomorrow. No. You're committed to the kingdom. Verse 7. Oh, I love this. Now we're getting practical and applicable, right? The Bible says, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. See, I told you it was comprehensive in its command. This passage of Scripture leaves no place for escape. It says, here's the thing, men. I want you to say these things that I have spoken over and over and over. And I wrote this down. Say the things that Jesus said. Speak the words that Christ has spoken because those are the words of royalty. You're speaking royal words when you quote Christ. There's nothing better to come out of my mouth than the things that have already come out of His. Those are royal words. I'm speaking royal words in my home to my children, to my church, to my friends, to my family, and to people that I'm just meeting. There's nothing better than speaking words spoken by royalty to the ears of others. He says you're going to have to do it again and again. You see, men, you can't get hyped up and talk about Jesus one time at the house. You're going to have to commit wholeheartedly. This is going to become a way of life around here. When I said God had no competition, I didn't just mean on Sundays. I mean every day. And that means instead of allowing others to infiltrate our home, we're going to let the Word of God rule and reign here in this place. We're going to let the name of Jesus be spoken often in this place. Prayer is going to unite us under this roof in this home. I am setting the standard. And men, if you need to reset the standard, good. Good. If the standard you have right now is not lining up with this, reset the standard. You have the authority to do it. It is your rightful authority on, based on the Word of God to reset the standard if you're in your home if that's what needs to happen. Just go ahead and do it. Get everybody together sometime today when you get home. And you get down on your knees with your family. And you repent of how you have missed the mark. And you tell them that is messed up. But we're resetting the standard today. And the kids are going to know, what does that mean, Daddy? It means this. Jesus is King of this place. It means we're going to talk a whole lot more about Him and a whole lot less about other stuff. It means that we're going to get together and pray as a family in the name of Jesus. And it means that you're going to see Daddy Start opening up that Bible that's been sitting over there on that shelf. And you're going to hear him read it. God convicted me earlier this year. David, you're reading the Bible, but you're not reading it out loud. You're studying it, but not in front of others. And he convicted me that I need to have my Bible out in my home and audibly read it. So that anybody that happens to be around, whether it's a three-year-old or a ten-year-old or my little bit older wife, That they would hear the word of God, royal words coming out of their husband or dad's mouth. Men, open up the Bible and just start reading. You don't have to call them all together. You can try that, and that's good if you do. But just start by opening up the Bible, turn into the Gospel of John, and start reading out loud. And just let those royal words bless your heart. You can do it. You can do it. Let's go to verse 8 and 9. The Bible says, Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Verse 9. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Tie them, wear them, and write them. Say, how do I do that? I've got a two-word answer for those three things. How am I going to tie them, wear them, and write them? Are you ready? Man, are you ready? Hobby Lobby.
There's some men looking at me like, what's that? <laughs> you can be quickly introduced to Hobby Lobby by any of these ladies in here. They'll tell you exactly where it is. All of them know the newest one's in Boone. That there's a bigger one in Winston. Right? I've been to them. I've been to all of them, I think. Why, why do we say why do we say in Hobby Lobby? Because honestly, honestly, you need the word up in your house. You you really don't need to be able to go in a room without there being a, a symbolic evidence of the presence of God in that place. Now, this is not superstitious. That's not going to ward off. We're not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm just talking about you and I need tangible reminders of who we are, who we serve, and what we're doing. We need those tangible reminders. I need to have a cross up somewhere so that I never forget the cross of Christ, even in my home. We need to have some kind of scripture up that says, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Why? To remind me and everybody in it that this is His place. We're His people. We need to have John 3.16 somewhere so that our kids see that we really do believe this stuff to the point we'll even spend money on it. We'll spend money on our faith. I don't know about you, but I'll spend money on my faith. We need to have Bibles open. We need to have Scripture frames made. You say, what, what is that accomplishing? It's taking the place of something else. You're putting something better on the wall. You're sharing the gospel with everybody that comes into your home. I'll quickly use this as an example. This play part back here that we built, do you know that the gospel is there even when I am not? Even if you're not down there, do you know the gospel is still there? Do you know why? Because you cannot get into that place without walking across the cross. There's a cross right there in the surface area. First thing you see. Do you know that throughout that play park, there's scripture here and scripture there. We've even got scripture in Braille for a blind person to pull their hand across and read the gospel. Why? Because we want people, if they come at 6 o'clock in the morning or 8 o'clock at night, to see who we are. And a slide and some swings is not who we are. Jesus is who we are. We just use the play park to show Him to them. People come into your home, they need to see Jesus. They need to know that that home belongs to the King. And you need to do all that you possibly can to make it as evident as possible. And then, when you speak and act, you're supporting what they've already seen. Well, I saw that scripture frame on the wall. I, I saw that cross, those names of Jesus. But I really saw Him in the way that they acted towards me, in the way that they treated me. Same thing with your kids and grandkids. The picture, the scripture is not going to do the work for you, it's just helping prepare the environment. Just helping to soften some hearts. You need to be the one showing Christ to your children and your grandchildren. Men, you are blessed with some of the most wonderfully Christ-like wives on planet Earth. I know them. But it is your responsibility to lead your home, to lead your wife and your children in a manner that exalts Jesus alone. And that doesn't have to be politically correct because I don't care. I just want to get it right according to the Bible. You understand the Bible says all things are passing away. The things I see are going to be gone. What's going to remain? Just Him. <laughs> that's who we're serving. Men, that's who you're called to serve. You can do it, Dad. You can do it, Grandpa. You can do it, Great Grandpa. You can do it, Coach. You can do it, Mentor. You can do it, Coworker. You can do it. Just 
let him do it through you. Lisa, would you come and play for us, please? This invitation is for every man in here. Whether you've got kids or not, this invitation is for you. Are you ready to set the standard? Are you willing to set the standard? God's made it clear what He expects. Are you willing to surrender to what He desires to accomplish through you in your home, in your family? Or you won't keep doing it your way? He wants all of you. He wants it consistent and daily. He wants to use you He's been using others to minister and bless you, but now it's your turn for Him to start using you to minister to and bless others. So I don't have any kids. Well, this invitation is for you so that you're prepared when they come. We're empty nesters. Well, I sure hope they'll peek back in every now and then. It'll be alright for them to see that the standard's been reset. Well, I have grandchildren. I'm just supposed to spoil them. Well, you can do that. But you can also show them Jesus.